Hey everybody, welcome to the Rumor Flies podcast. As always, I'm Josh. And I'm Ryan. And I'm Greg. And today we're here with our supplemental episode. And we brought along two special guests for the occasion. We have David and we have Jeremy. David, say hi. Hello, how are you? Jeremy, say hello. Hello. And uh, David and Jeremy- Dance like a monkey. Oh, God damn it, Greg. (laughs) (laughs) So David and Jeremy are two very good friends of the podcast. They're really good dudes and they have a lot of experience and knowledge- about the subject we're about to cover, which is movies. Now, this is something that we don't have a lot of uh, r- rumors. Is that what you say, Ryan? Yeah, so this is weird because we wanted to do a lot of rumors based around movies because we're all movie buffs, like all three of us in general with the podcast. But the thing is, is that most times with movies, either it's a straight yes or no answer, and it's kind of like, oh, no, that's just that didn't actually happen or that definitely did happen. There's nothing where there's a lot of debate in between it. We could get into that a little bit with a few different movies and directors and such and such. Yeah. It was nothing that's generally in the heads of most of the population. It's mainly in movie buffs' minds. And we kind of just wanted to still cover it. So we decided to get some people on and just kind of like have this like round table to talk about movies and maybe throw in a little bit of rumors there while we're at it. We should maybe call it a square table because the table's not round. Yeah, and we got five people. It's a it's a <laughs> pentagram. Well, and the the problem that you run into with this is that it's hard to verify everything, you know, as far as whether it be true or false. I mean, some things you can, but other things, a lot of it's just hearsay, and there's a lot of dirty secrets in Hollywood. I mean, we could do an entire episode of, like, Stanley Kubrick or 2001 in yeah, general but- or even The Shining, you know, but there's not even movies and stuff done about that. It's been... You know, kind of done to death. So we're just kind of doing this a little bit casual. We're not even sure if we're going to censor this or not. Shit. <laughs> so we'll find out about that. You guys know before us. So so the thing about it is this is going to be very free form. It's not, you know, it's not going to be addressing rumors or anything like that. There will be that kind of aspect to it at parts. But this is just going to be an open dialogue kind of thing. Just, you know, just shooting the shit and having some fun and something to hold you over till season two starts in the near future. So the general format of this episode is going to be that Josh, me, and Greg are going to pose some questions to David and Jeremy, and we're going to pitch in too, but it's going to kind of be like just an open discussion between all of us about these questions that we're posing. Some of them are going to be fun, some are going to be a little bit more heavy, but ultimately it's going to kind of keep to the nature of this podcast. It's not going to be just straight up like, you know, a movie pod. Yeah, this is going to be less educational, though, than, you know, things that we've covered. There's no sources for this. Yeah, so don't don't check the show notes for anything like that. There won't be any. No. Some cursory Google searches and fun conversation, basically. This but, is uh, this is just meant to be something to tide you all over till the show starts up again. Greg isn't even a fact checker today. No, he's not. I'm literally just watching levels and talking. Well, I guess with that being said, Greg, I think you want to kick us off with the first question? Oh, wait, no, we're kicking off with this over here. Oh, oh, God damn it. All right, Ryan, you want to lead off with the first question? Jeez. You want to say it a little less pessimistically? <sighs> no. Ryan, you want to lead us off with the first question? Sure, I'll, <laughs> I'll go ahead and do that. So I guess to start a little bit lighthearted, there's always been kind of a debate, especially now, about if there's a difference between a movie and a film. And you could really go into that for a while, but I want to get a little bit more specific to kind of narrow it down. And specifically in a genre that it's really hard to distinguish between the two, and that is more of comedy. I guess I'll throw a rumor in there real quick. So Three Men and a Baby. Y'all have heard the ghost rumor? Supposedly in the background of a scene of Three Men and a Baby. In the bathtub. Yeah, in the bathtub scene. There was a ghost and everybody was worrying about that the entire time saying, oh, there's the, the fucking movie scene. With, like the entire set was haunted. It was just a It was a, a cardboard cutout. cutout. Yeah. But generally in terms of comedies, you know, that doesn't have too much to do with it. But really the idea of what would you consider to be a comedy film versus a comedy movie. And I guess I'm going by my preconceived idea of a film being more artistically driven as opposed to just kind of uh, crank it out just for more viewers, you know, for a general audience, something you have to like kind of think about, something that put a little bit more thought than to just slapstick and gags. Not to say that, you know, once again, a comedy film couldn't be gags, but... Uh, that's generally the kind of idea that I want to get from you two guys. So I guess I'll let uh, David, you want to start off with this one? Well, uh, personally, I, I think terms like that are completely arbitrary. You okay, know? that's uh, good. In terms of that, uh, comedy actually isn't the first thing that I go to, but I've definitely seen uh, things before, like uh, we've talked before about Enter the Void or um, Under the Skin, and those are things where it, it kind of blurs that, those lines where the way that I would talk about them is I would actually refer to them more as visual art 
okay. you know, more than anything else, like Nick Reffin's movies, like uh, Only God Forgives, they fall in the, to that territory. But for me personally, um, not a big, big comedy movie fan, at least the stuff that's been coming out for the last 20 years. But, you know, I just look at um, films and movies as just different terms that people choose. Some people use the term movie. Some people use the term film. Right. Well, I think to me, comedy is the hardest thing to kind of differentiate between a movie and a film. Or to even get respect for. Exactly, because, I mean, think about the best comedy you've ever seen, like your favorite comedy movie as an individual. What makes it an artistic comedy, well, But not even that. If I were to ask 10 different people what their favorite comedy is, I guarantee you that I would get 10 different answers that are not even close to each other. You know, if I pulled 10 people their favorite film of all time, I guarantee you one of them would be a Tarantino film, one of them would be a Scorsese film, one of them would be a a Kubrick film. Like, you can kind of, you know, see where people go with these things. And you can you can kind of tell the the, the the trends that people have and they follow with their favorite director and their favorite films. As far as comedy goes, like, you know, people shit on Adam Sandler, but his older stuff was absolutely hilarious. I grew up loving Happy Gilmore and Billy Madison. But when you look back at it, I mean, number one, my favorite five favorite comedies are Dylon, 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 oh, Dylon, Jesus and Christ. Dylon. But I mean, in terms of comedy, like, I guess the the real question is what differentiates a comedy just from being a summer I don't even want to say blockbuster but just like a summer crank out film or just one that really um, I guess makes you say wow that was a good movie because there's a funny movie and then there's a good movie you I'm, know? I'm gonna I'm gonna disagree yeah, with go Josh on this Adam Sandler thing oh uh, here's Jeremy uh, on Adam Sandler <laughs> being funny when he first started versus how he's not funny now I don't no, think Adam I, Sandler has changed one bit. Are we going to talk I, okay. about Grown Ups? Okay. Well, no, 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 we're going to no. talk about. We can talk about any one of his movies. His movies are exactly the same. I will agree with that. It's not that I dislike him now. I'm saying people don't like him now. I'm not saying that I don't. I think that he's done some really interesting things, and I think that he's tried. Okay, there we go. It's going to happen. I know. I got one coming up soon. I, I think he he hasn't really changed his stripes, so to say. But I think that it, you know, people just perceive him in a different light. I'm not saying that I do. I'd I've, agree with that because uh, yeah. Go ahead, we, go ahead. The audience grew up. He didn't. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. That is a great way to put it. I will agree with that. But there are people that have changed stripes. Like the best instance is uh, Eddie Murphy. Disagree. Disagree. Disagree completely. Wait, so you think that Beverly Hills Cop is the same as Norbert? No, I'm. I think I was going to say that exact same way. <laughs> I was. I'm going to say <laughs> that. That's why we have a podcast. Right? Having having yeah, seen coming to America, another great one. Great. David. Having seen both movies, he he got more immature over time, whereas his audience grew up even more. Because if you look at Coming to America versus Norbit, Coming to America came out in '85. Norbit came out in '95. That's ten year difference. About was it '95? Really? I, I have no clue. Okay. I'm just, kind, like of, a I'm just kind of guessing. It's, it's just the nutty professor. Yeah, yeah. So it, Norbert's like in the two thousand. Okay, that 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 helps my point out even more is the fact that over fifteen years he got way more immature with his movies. If he would have kept going with things like, um, even though the professor was funny, I don't think it's like like coming thing, to America. It, it just it got it got ridiculous. Pluto Nash, uh, Holy Man. You can the list goes on with Eddie Murphy Trading movies. Places. Their ter- Trading Places was not bad. No, 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 no. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying like another. Instance of a really good older film that he did. Yeah, and most movies from the 80s aren't really gut-busting movies like they were in the 90s or the 2000s or even Mo- now. Movies from the 80s don't hold up today. They I don't. enjoy The Breakfast Club, but it doesn't transition well into today's modern era. I very much think that Coming to America would still hold up today. I think the thing with Eddie Murphy is that it's not that... I, I consider it to be like a cash-out effect to the point where he decided... Yeah, I can make funny movies, or I can make ones that are potentially going to be broadcasted to a broader audience. Like, the age of R-rated movies is almost out the door. They don't make money anymore. So, I disagree. Oh, go ahead. No, no, please. I disagree. I disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> Being super polite. It's okay. It's okay. Everybody wants to say go things. Ahead. Go ahead. No, like no, no. It. This is what it's for. Go ahead, man. Go um, ahead. The R-rated comedies, no. Um, you, to, to get back to your original point of what is considered a film and a movie if you're looking at um the golden globes nominees for best comedy how many of those actually make you laugh the martian the Mar- exactly the martian that was a comedy yes. that was nominated for a comedy but they they will now it's it's they, changed they've, now they've amended it yes. they have amended it okay but if you look at the movies that have been nominated for best comedy they're not movies that make you 
laugh. There are exceptions. The Hangover won for Best Comedy Movie when it came out. But for the most part, it's lost in translation. It's sideways, which are funny movies, but they're not like gut busting. Well, like when I watch Tommy comments. Boy every time, well, I was gonna get it, to it makes me giggle. It makes me laugh. I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying the moment of that. What were we gonna say, David? No, I, I don't want to transition the no, conversation no, completely. Fine, but off of uh, Ryan's point, I think it's actually interesting what you were talking about about nobody goes to movie theaters anymore. I think my theory, and it went to a conversation I was having earlier about uh, comedies, was that people are only going to the movie. I think what's going to be happening in the next five to ten years with the way that Netflix, which is relevant because Adam Sandler's um, next yeah, his four films, movie just came out. Yeah. Well, I think he's got like a six or a four. Yeah, movie he deal. signed up like a like a four four, four picture deal. He's got two in. Two I actually personally think that that was brilliant on his part because I th- what I believe personally is that in the next five years uh, people are only going to be going to the movies for the, the spectacle aspect things that you're going to see in IMAX 3D so you are still seeing um, you know the Jungle Book and Disney films and Marvel films really blowing up the you know making record numbers but you take a movie that came out this week like uh, or last week or the last two weeks but Neighbors uh Two. Yeah, neighbors, yeah, Neighbors yeah. 2. Um, if you actually look at it, Neighbors, the first Neighbors, uh, its opening weekend came in with $40 million. And mm-hmm. the second one, usually sequels do better in the movie theater, actually only made half, less than half really? what it's making. I actually had an idea about that, too, with especially comedy movies. We were talking about this beforehand. I was going to bring it up as a question, but I guess mm-hmm. I may as well now. Yeah. We were talking about how for comedy movies, there is an expiration date to when you can make a sequel without it being absolutely terrible. Zoolander proved that. Dumb and Dumber Dumb and proved Dumber. that. Yeah, like was, so yeah. many have done. I think Anchorman. there's like a two year limit for a lot of them. Anchorman, Anchorman yeah. too. actually, although to be fair, the first Anchorman did not do on the box office either. Well, that became which a was cult very film. Interesting. That's yeah. different. But that's what's interesting, and that's why I think well, Super well, Troopers two. I, I is think we'll bomb. get in, we'll get into that <laughs> later. Yeah. I think from what David was saying though is pretty much movie theaters have become like the vinyl of film to the point where it's a novelty as opposed I say to it's that yet because internationally especially. It's still a lot. I mean, look at these opening weekends well, uh, for Star Wars. That's the a good Avengers. point. Well, 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 just and and I was reading recently. You know, Warcraft came yeah, out. I was gonna say Warcraft. That movie looks like a piece of garbage. Okay, it's Duncan Jones. But though. it broke but it every China. record in China. It did. It 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 obliterated every record that well, they had. Well, because there's all gold farmers over well, there. It, they need to get matter. off their job of playing it, Warcraft to sell it, on eBay. It doesn't matter. No matter how much money. I mean, they were saying that Duncan Jones, who directed Warcraft, okay, they were saying that that movie might derail his career. And the and China alone has saved his ass. He's a hundred million dollars by North Korea. I I think yeah, that, you're right, Jeremy. Yeah, you're right. I mean that actually goes into kind of maybe a topic that I'm talking about, which is an interesting fact about yeah. China. Is a lot of American studios there actually in terms of their growth, they don't really see American American audience movie going audience as growth. But a statistic from um, something that I read said that there's actually on average one movie screen built a day in China really? and what's happening with American wow. distribution like uh, you mentioned the Free State of Jones was actually sponsored by I believe a Korean company but they're yeah. actually going to Asia to um, not only look for financing for their films but they're also starting to eye those markets for box office they they it's actually a 1. see 3 billion person market well, yeah, yeah I mean it's it's the largest population in all the world if I'm correct I mean there's more people in, in China than there is anywhere else if I, if India I'm, yeah, 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 India. Okay, that's but that's still in most Asia. Dense. It's it's still in Asia. Yeah. Well, so one of the and things different economic realities. One of the things that I did want to bring up though, Ryan, Thanks, to kind of not not deter your question, but it's one thing that I think is important to point out is that to me as an individual, as a movie watcher, as Josh, there is a huge difference between a comedy and a dark comedy, and I think that. Uh, what you're looking at me weird. I, I was gonna round it out, but go ahead. What you're doing? Well, my whole thing with it though is that. I have a very hard time seeing comedies as a film because to me, a film is more of an artistic experience. And I love Wedding Crashers. I think Wedding Crashers is hilarious, but I wouldn't exactly call Wedding Crashers a film. I think it's fun and I think it's a it's really good movie to watch. And if it's on TBS when I'm flipping channels, I'll keep it on. But In Bruges to me is a great uh, film. I was going to talk about that. Oh, well. It, it, it's a wonderful, wonderful, great film. But even the term dark comedy itself is a very arbitrary thing because does it focus more on the comedy or does it focus more on the dark nature of the film? Yeah, I, I guess it's kind of like a, almost a schadenfreude type of deal where it's yeah. like 
you kind of make light of somebody else's plight. And I guess British humor is a lot better at that than American humor. But I, 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 we should round this up so you can get to yours. But I guess the interesting part about this, David, I was really expecting you to like have a little bit... For the record, uh, listeners, David uh, actually has a lot of experience in the film industry. He can go into as much as he wants to later on if he wants to or not. But <laughs> I'll pass. I, we trust thoughtful. his opinion, and I thought he would be able to be like, yeah, there's definitely a dichotomy between like film and movies. But no, he's just like arbitrary. And I respect that totally. I guess I was being a little bit harsh in, in that term. But I guess we'll just go ahead and just do a quick round the way, off the top the of your head. The quickest way to tell someone's not in the industry is that they're not cynical about movies. <laughs> <laughs> I guess off, off the top of the head, we'll go off with, real quick before we go to the next question, what you consider to be the most artistic comedy possible. And I'm going to say probably me and Josh's answer in Bruges. Yeah. Um, it, it depends, though. Are you t- talking comedy or are you talking dark comedy? Are, are you talking like can they both encompass the same thing as comedy? Now you're splitting what? hairs. Just say the first thing you're thinking of. Uh, okay. Uh, the most artistic comedy. Yeah, I'd probably go with in Bruges. Okay. Greg? I mean, it's probably not the most artistic, but one that I think is incredibly stylized and artistic, despite that is uh, Thank You for Smoking. Oh, yeah. That's another good one. That's a very good one. Insanely stylized film and just brilliant acting. David, tell us Dear why God. yours is A Fish Called Wanda. No, I haven't <laughs> seen A Fish Called Wanda. I'd actually go a two-part. I'll go the dark and then the regular. Okay. Uh, I mean, mine is the stock Annie Hall. You okay, know, that's, Annie, no, that's totally Annie Hall's fair. the stock film, comedy film, but in terms of dark... Uh, Last few months, I saw Filth, which I just thought was a film. beautiful movie, hyper stylized. <laughs> Jeremy's shaking his Jeremy head. Jeremy, I, I hate I hate both of those movies <laughs> so so much. Those are awful movies. I'm sorry, but those are just crap. That's okay. I know Annie Hall won Best Picture, but I'm pissed off at Annie Hall because it won over Star Wars. Well, so, so Jeremy, tell I don't want to. I don't want to open the gap because I'll be talking well, the whole time. I'm, I'm going to go with David's. Uh, I'll we're, go with we're, Dark. We're comedy. rounding this off. There's yeah. no more defense. Yeah, Jeremy, no, you have yeah. the podium. Jeremy, uh, tell us your favorite Tyler Perry movie. <laughs> I've only seen one. Um, <laughs> as far as dark comedy goes, I'll have to go with Very Bad Things. Um, oh, that's another that's, very good one. Wow. Okay, I didn't even. Th- that's out of left field, right but that, there. That to me is one of the the earlier dark comedies that really took the tone of the film and ran with it. Was that the first Dead Hooker film? I believe so. I think. Well, it was when somebody that. says dark comedy, the first movie that pops into my head is always that or a Robin Williams movie, which he tried to go dark with, mm, which are a lot of them. Because not there are Father several. of the Year. Don't say that one. I mean, World's Greatest Dead. Oh, that's right. That's right. World's I mean, it was dead. dark, but it's not one of his better dark comedies. Yeah, I, I'd, agree um, with I'd go with um, that was darker than comedy. Death to Smoochie? Insomnia. Death to Smoochie. Yeah, Death to okay. Smoochie. Insomnia. Insomnia wasn't, wasn't a comedy. That wasn't. A comedy. That's, that's why I was saying our photo was a comedy. Yeah. Photo. Yeah. That's why I was like, right. uh, as far as silly comedies, uh, Tommy Boy, South Park, Bigger, Longer, and Uncut, um, Kingpin. Never go wrong Kingpin's with those. Enough. But I, I, I want to say that uh, I think uh, with film and movie. Um, if you're looking at comedy being one or the other, it's more of rewatchability. Like if you can watch this movie more over and over, I've That's seen fair. Tommy. I've seen Tommy Boy a hundred times, yeah. and every time I watch it, it's it's obviously going to be less funny. You mentioned um, Wedding Crashers. I love Wedding Crashers too, but I can't watch I can't watch Wedding Crashers anymore. I've seen it so many times. I know all the jokes. I know what's coming. With but very bad is, things. But the point is, you have seen it. Oh, of course, times. I've seen it, but I've seen every movie. You've wanted to rewatch it though. Every movie, uh, listeners, you've heard it here. Jeremy has seen every movie. Ever every single created. movie. Quote me on that. We have never um, used hyperbole in this podcast oh, ever. I, Literally, he every saw the day movie. the clown cried. I want to throw. I can't. That, that comes out in a couple years. Yeah. It's going to be released. I'm looking forward to that. I want to throw in Pee Wee's Big Adventure to see if you also want to trash that as well. <laughs> see, okay, no, now, 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 Josh, Josh brought up to me the difference between a movie and a film, and I had just watched the new Pee Wee movie, and I even, I even, I told Josh, I said there's a huge difference between movies and film because the Pee Wee movie is a movie. A film is going to be is something completely different. I'm not going to go into my favorites, but uh, the Pee Wee movie is not a film. It's not. Scorsese. I'm not saying you have to be Scorsese to make no, a film, yeah. but it's not going to be so movie plus Pee-wee. art equals film. Basically, I mm. think that's a very simplistic that's, that's answer. Like, yes. Yeah, but I, I think rule that, of thumb. That's yeah. what we're shooting for. Okay, if if you say it like this, anybody who draws a, a, a kindergarten, like our kindergarten kid can draw a picture and call it art, but it's not going to be the same thing as the Mona Lisa, right? Well, it's the same. It's in the same ballpark, but it's completely different. That's the difference between a movie and a film, right there. Well, is it intent? Well, wait, that. is it intent or content? 
Um, that's a whole different discussion. You're, I don't think we're going to get into. Head, I'm saying, is All it right. intent or is it content that makes it art? So we got it there. We'll have people write in if they want to on this one. <laughs> yeah, please. Josh, go ahead, take us off. Well, I, I just, I, I think that's a good point that Ryan brought up. If, like, if you have opinions on anything that we talk about in this little supplemental episode. Please feel free to write in. We'll give you all the ways, I'm sure, at the end on how to contact us. But th- we are very passionate about this, as you can tell. We-, we-, we love talking about all this stuff. So please, again, write in if that's something that you want to partake in. We'll give you David's personal number so you can text him. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> so the-, the question that I had now, th- this is less of a-, of a like a rumor or a myth or a misconception. And it's more of just a personal opinion on as you as a viewer on how you you view this and how you hold this to you individually. What is your feeling? And I'll start with Jeremy. What is your feeling when it comes to movies that are and I'm and and the air quotes are coming through the microphone, a ripoff of another film, i.e. The Lion King and Kimba the Lion? Let's go into a little background for that for anybody. Yeah. Okay. So The Lion King is. Okay, so The Lion King is, you know, everybody knows The Lion King. It's one of the greatest movies of all time. But before The Lion King was The Lion King, there was Kimba the Lion, which was a Japanese movie, if I believe I'm correct, that came out before The Lion King did. And it is a very eerie, similar movie that The Lion King was based off of. And I'm not saying shot for shot, but there is a lot of similarities between the two. And so, Jeremy, what is your opinion on movies that kind of run parallel and maybe breach that ethnic, the, uh, that ethical kind of standpoint? The ethical standpoint. I know. I almost said ethnical. It's the beer. The, like, as a director and, and as, you know, a movie studio or anything like that, like, is there some kind of ethics into not copying the latest film? Because, I mean, I'll use comedy as another example. There's a lot of films that are derived from other comedy films, and it's a lot of the same things. But I don't think that you can sit there and say that it's the same movie over and over again. I know that's a a harsh criticism that films have, that it's, you know, if you have The Hangover and then you have The Hangover Part 2, you're like, oh, well, it's The Hangover all over again. That's fine. Whatever. Or rather that uh, The Hangover is derivative of blank. I I guess we can go with, like, you know, in terms of if you were to take something and then pretty much rip from it but make it better then is that justified? Yeah. Because I, I, a, a music example would be Hurt by Nine Inch Nails. And Johnny Cash. Yes. I mean, uh, for the record, has anybody seen the video? I know I sent it to you guys. Uh, Guy Fieri eating to Johnny Cash's Hurt. That's it's amazing. one of the greatest things I've ever <laughs> seen. Uh, but that's kind of the idea we're going with. Like, movies where if you take it, I guess a good example would be... Well, I brought up The Lion King and, and, and Kimbo. And we'll let David get into this one afterwards, but Jaren, let you go first. But uh, good, another example is Abra de Ojos and Vanilla Sky. They are practically the same movie. Or even... Well, we got that. Or we'll even... Uh, w- what is it? Uh, the Departed and... Uh, what's Infernal the re- Affairs. Infernal In- Affairs. Thank you, David. Well, yeah. I, well, I'm sorry. One, I'd just like to hop... They did that intentionally. Well, that was well. Go I ahead, just David. like to hop in and, and, and just to ask to, to have the question clarified, sure, which sure. is: um, is are we differentiating whether or not the film says it's an adapted screenplay or not? Because uh, Abre los Ojos and Vanilla Sky well, okay. are. Okay, that's a that's a very fair question. I think that if it's something, if it's a movie that's based off a short, let's just say for example, I think that's totally fair as long as they acknowledge that there is a precedent that is there that they're basing it off of. It's fine. But Disney never marketed The Lion King as anything with Kimbra. Yeah, that's a good point. It, it, there, if you're acknowledging that this is what it's derived from, that's fine. There were like, six Wizard of Oz's, well, pretty much. It, there, and how many? There was what eighty something books. Yeah. Let's just say fifteen. No, there's more than that. There's fifteen books. I promise you, I have all of them. Fact checker, Greg, get on your phone. <laughs> well, it's, it's just I think there's <laughs> there's a huge you know differentiation between. A movie that's based off a short and a movie that just blatantly rips off of something else. So, Jeremy, I'll let you jump in after me talking. Okay. Um, as soon as you said that, my initial thought went to uh, these movies that today you go to Walmart, you'll see um, Atlantic Rim instead of Pacific Rim. Yeah, you'll see I had Transmorphers these... instead of Transformers. Snakes on a Train instead oh, of Snakes on a Train. Oh, what's the studio? They, they, they yeah, there's a whole studio that comes out with them. and stuff like that. Yeah. 
I if, forgot the name. If of you're them. gonna make a shitty remake of a movie or something to, I guess, deceive the general public, because every time I see these movies, I think of my grandmother going and being like, "Oh, I think Jeremy wanted to see that movie. I should pick it up for him," and then <laughs> getting it and being like, "What the f- is this?" Well, uh, there's <clears throat> there's the the story that I always think was something like that. There was somebody that I remember Ryan went to high school with. His grandparents wanted to go see Knocked Up, but they couldn't remember the name of the movie. So they're like, oh, 28 weeks later, that must be the film that it is. <laughs> oh. Completely different film than what they were <laughs> expecting. I'm, I'm seeing dozens of books on here. It might be, now your definition might be like officially written by the author. There are 14 actual books by uh, Baum. And there are right, a, a few bunch. other uh, like short probably, stories. Well, a bunch of other writers have. Oh written yeah, there's uh, there's and there's uh, like dozens upon dozens I'm seeing on this. So list. we're both right. We are both right. So we'll go with Kimba as the example at then. <laughs> because that's probably the most uh, that's the most forward in the mind. That was not an adapted screenplay. That was pretty. That was the closest thing to a blatant ripoff, but became uh, arguably a better movie. What, what what I'll say is that if if you can take something and improve upon it, go for it. If if the Lion okay. King is better than Kimbro, then Kimbra. then what if people, Kimbra, Kimbra. whatever. <laughs> but if I was consi- we're just what if like you changing the you name. Thought, if you thought you were going to make it improved and consensus that you failed, does that mean you lost your right or yeah. something? Then yeah. If 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 Disney did a shitty version of this movie, just go then for it. Just I go think. For it. There, there we is. go. Okay. <laughs> if uh, if Disney did a shitty version of Kimbra uh, with the Lion King, then yeah, give up on what you're doing because it's not working. Um, if it makes money, of course you're going to keep doing it. But I think it's fine as long as you're improving on what's already there. Well, I, I'm just I want to focus more of you as a movie viewer, as somebody who's seen you know so many movies out there, and somebody who's very critical of movies. You know, would it skew your view of a movie if you knew that it was not an original piece? Exactly. exactly. Even like, though the legwork it, was already done, they just it's more of like an editorial thing as opposed to. But there's no credit given to this other film. Can you give me an example of more one that's more recent? I mean, no, not off the top of my head. Because no. I'm, I'm thinking like maybe remakes. I don't mind remakes, but See, these movies, but remakes, those are giving credit where credits that, due. Yeah, that's a different animal. So like, I, I really can't think of any off the top of my head that are that I can disagree with. I mean, I, I feel like that would be anything in general if you know that something like somebody makes a joke and you saw that same joke on Reddit, you're not gonna. You, you're gonna be like, I, I, you got that off of Reddit, you piece of shit. You, you didn't come up with that off the top of your head. Putting your flavor versus, on it. Okay. Versus whether um, you haven't seen it, like something a joke you've heard versus you haven't heard. Because if you've heard a joke before, you're be like, oh yeah, I've already heard this. You're gonna completely cut the person off and be like, yeah, I, I heard this joke before. Okay. But if you haven't, you're gonna listen to the whole joke and be like, that's really funny. You're not knowing where the source material was uh, or anything like that. You making it your own. Okay. I no, I, I understand. Uh, David, I want to know your thoughts on this, man. Well, uh, I think the first thing that came to my mind when you mentioned The Lion King is what my mind immediately went to was that um, I, whenever I think of a, uh, whenever I think of The Lion King, I think of Hamlet. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's another great. That's another great parallel with that. Yeah. So it's dual layer. <laughs> well, yeah. Exactly. I mean, it's it's not as simple as just like this is exactly like this i mean there's different facets that kind of encompass that story but that's a great point david yeah but uh, personally for me um if it's if it's blatant i'm going to speak mostly towards giving credit to Uh original scripts uh scripts but in terms of two movies that are um very very similar in theme whether they're ripped off or credit is acknowledged Uh as i i actually as a movie viewer i love to kind of look at them side by side and kind of compare how they dramatically go through the motions of telling the story. And I think a great example is a, a, one that I constantly think about. I was thinking about it when you were mentioning it was uh, Gus Van Sant's Psycho, which is, uh, uh, you know, the okay. one that came out in the 90s. I don't think there's anybody here that'll say that it's a good movie. Um, <laughs> but uh, Jeremy, course, you Jeremy, think it's a good movie? Okay. Well, I didn't mind it at all. I thought it was, I, it was, it was a good idea. Yeah. I think that uh, him... Taking the place, because uh, I don't know Vince if the Vaughn. viewers know. No, I'm talking about uh, how Alfred Hitchcock is in all of his movies in a certain, uh, in, in yeah. some sort of way he's in his movies. I thought Gun, uh, Gus Van Sant being in taking uh, Alfred Hitchcock's place uh, where Alfred Hitchcock was in the movie. I thought that was kind of a cool idea. I didn't mind the movie. I think it was like, a great movie. Yeah. But like a cool I, homage to him. Exactly. Uh, there was good homage. Well, I wouldn't say that it's a bad film. To me, it's, it's an endlessly fascinating movie. And to the people may be listening right now one one of the things that they wouldn't know uh about this psycho is the the 1990s psycho is essentially what gus van zandt what a lot of people think that he was doing was creating a shot 
for shot, music to music, edit to edit, remake of the film. So that essentially stylistically, if you were to play them on two adjacent screens at the same time, you would see the exact same thing just with different actors. Um, you know, to me, it is interesting. You know, a lot of people, because of the other films that they see Van Zant making, they think that maybe it was almost kind of like an, like an art film an art film experiment where essentially he was trying to say if you were to take a movie and recreate it exactly what would be the difference you know uh, artistically like how could you really compare those things and to to me I guess to bring it back into your original question I like to see them side by side and see and compare strengths you know against one another you could almost say that for the Star Wars films now Star Wars Episode 7 sorry for anybody that hasn't watched it yet but it's pretty much (laughs) just like I'm not going to get into it but it's pretty much a varied version of a new hope and i episode seven is personally my favorite one it's almost like an improved version on a new hope and that's the weird part about it is like i see all the blatant like how much legwork they did not have to do in order to write that script because of the way they formatted it but the way they did it was stylistically better and obviously it wasn't a rebel film like exactly like what george lucas was originally going for he was he didn't have like the big studios behind him at that point. It was JJ Abrams had every tool to his disposal at this point. And that's pretty much what Disney with the Lion King and then Kimba the White Lion had. It's kind of like, you know, which one would be better? The one that came up with the original idea and kind of laid the groundwork for it or the people that had everything to their disposal to make it the perfect movie that it could be. Well, well let me ask you this, David. If you were to take, you know, Gus Van Sant's version of Psycho and you were to take it and play it in the 1950s when Psycho came out okay do you think it would have if garnered such a response that Psycho did I I, I don't know you know I, I, I really mean, I know it's a hard question to answer but I guess what I'm asking is like do you think that Psycho the remake would would warrant just as much accreditation as the original Psycho did I mean Again, I don't want to, you know, no, it's called okay. to not I mean, answer, but it's just no, so yeah. iconic. You I think know? there's one fundamental difference, though, is that, sure, is that if it come out that time, it's like, but the fact is, like, it didn't, and that movie happened because the first one did. Yeah, and, and I think that's a very But I know what you're argument. saying, like, yeah. is it, like, is it good enough visually? It's like, sure, but it's the whole thing, like, people always say, well... We were talking about this. Weren't we talking about this? Like Heath Ledger was cast the Joker, and everyone was like, "How could they possibly pick this guy?" And yeah, then now everyone's yeah. tune is, "Oh my God, how could it be anyone but him?" Right? And it's it's this idea that like Casablanca could never be remade. Even, I think you'd be an idiot to remake it because you're fighting so much. However, I think it could be. And I think any have to fight be studios for that too. Yes. Casablanca, like they would King have Kong's to have remade how many times? And many of them are iconic. Multiple King Kongs are iconic. <laughs> and the, the funny apes. part is, I That's wouldn't say that the Del Toro version is iconic. Or sorry, Peter Jackson, not Del Toro. I was gonna say, like, we're not talking about Pacific Rim, but they're the same scraggly-looking, overweight I'll man. Defend Pacific Rim every uh, day. I'd like to make an assumption yeah, and actually ahead. bring another film into discussion because I think I believe that all of you guys have seen it, and I believe that you guys all would have opinions on it, which is uh, one of the more interesting directors, or one of my favorite directors to come out in the last twenty years is Michael Haneke, who originally did funny games in dutch and then uh he originally did it so this is hearsay uh don't look into this at all but it was a criticism <laughs> please was a, don't look up what i'm about to say <laughs> yeah almost as a criticism on uh violence in american films specifically american horror films well seven you know he makes a few more films and he gets widely respected and he has the opportunity to remake this film in america in english with uh, naomi watts and some other stars Mm -hmm. so you actually have a director who wrote a screenplay directed it in one language and then remade it again in english and comparing his films like you know one could do that's a great point yeah well, Jeremy, you obviously have a lot of thoughts about that. I, I did enjoy Funny Games. I thought it was great. Michael Pitt's one of my favorite actors. Are you talking about the, the, the new the, the, one? The, the, the new Dutch? one, yes. Yeah. I, I didn't see I the think, original one. I think one, so. I, but think I do so. know it is, it's pretty much a shot-by-shot remake. To, to piggyback on The Psycho, I watched both of those movies back-to-back. Um, oh, really? Okay, and cool. And I will say that uh, if you weren't sure, if the movie from the 90s came out, it back uh, with the in original the 50s, one yeah. in the fifties. Then yes, that movie would still hold up then because it it pretty much was shot by shot, with few very very minor exceptions because of camera work and what we the difference in what we can do now versus what we could do back in the fifties with Hitchcock. Right, right, right. Um, it's pretty much the same movie. I 
I, I think it's a great, great point with Michael Haneke, uh, with him doing funny games. Um, the fe- it was a shot by shot remake, except for just in a different language. And the fact that you could do that was pretty fascinating to me. I loved Funny Games. I, I thought it was a very brilliant movie. Now I I knew it was a remake of the original, but I never saw the original. Yeah. But I Nor really did, did I. enjoy the, the remake of it. I thought it was a really interesting piece, and I thought it was really fun in a very twisted way. But yes, I thought it was definitely. very I thought it was a very fun film, and I, and I liked I liked the way he went about it. You put Michael Pitt in anything, and it's watchable. That's true. So uh, I guess we'll, we'll kind of jump into Greg now. I know you have another question. So um, are we going to the Star Wars one now? Yeah, whatever you want, Yeah, man. so I also want to make sure we're, we're, we're on the same page. Um, so it's less of a question, more just kind of like a funny thing that it just kind of goes into like these these amazing movie myths, right? Not myth in the sense that like we talked about um, one of the ones we found out wasn't true. Um, people bring up Goldfinger and how the actress died who was painted gold like that's not true um but a lot of people you know as a kid i remember hearing that all the time but um you have all these amazing stories and backgrounds and one of the most i guess famous ones i've heard is is that harrison ford on the set of star wars i forgot which one it was probably a new hope yeah i think it was probably a new hope, new hope. that was my, and my initial reaction. if i can remember correctly he says george you can type this shit, but you can't say it you can't make me say it. No, yeah. he says you yeah. can't say it. He says you can't say it. I thought he can't make me say it. But I look at it and says it's just you can't say it. Oh, okay. You can type this, shit, but you can't say it. <laughs> and like, and um, and he followed. It was during an interview, and he followed up saying, "And wouldn't you know it? He won best screen, yeah, best screenplay that year, like <laughs> Oscar for best screenplay." <laughs> and, and I guess it's, that's... It's, and it goes like, um, um, Alec Guinness, right? Who yeah. like Alec Guinness? He's and, the only one that home. made money on the entire series, like in the entire first movie. Yeah, because he, he for went yeah. pay, and he's like, this movie is. He's like, this is not art. He's like, this is not high art. He's he's a very famous actor and classically he, trained, classic trained. Yes. and he Having got rid of beforehand. and yeah, he exactly. and he said, um, no pay, five percent of the gross. Brilliant. And he What's lived off budget? that. His kids off of a, live off of it. Oh, I'm very sorry to interrupt you, but do you know off the top of your head what the budget for the a new I Hope cannot was? remember. I know that Lucas didn't get paid for the movie. He uh, he, he went sold strictly. It all off he went strictly with uh, merchandising. Merchandising. So, so, he made so more did Spielberg. Money than made. So did Spielberg. For, and that's for which the, movie? Uh, he so Spielberg took, and, and uh, Lucas actually kind of crossed over. I, I know this is something that that maybe not a lot of people know is that as far as Spielberg and Lucas go, they basically traded a little bit, and Lucas got a little bit of the Indiana Jones franchise, and Spielberg got a little bit. Of the Star Wars franchise, yeah, it turns out the Rolling Ball and Indiana Jones was not a hot seller toy. So. Yeah, they they but they gave them, you know, they got like one or two percent of uh, of the other person's um, profit from the movies. Well, you, you always seen Spaceballs, right? Yeah. I mean, the the, cl- yeah, that, the classic scene uh, with Yogi is going. It's like, how do you make money? Merchandise and merchandise. Where the real money from the movies made? Which is also because George Lucas helped them with their effects under the um, condition condition that they would not sell merchandise yeah. but i guess so it's like a double thing where it's like he made all his money off of that and they were not allowed to sell merchandise we, we <laughs> so got to rail from it a little bit it. <laughs> i guess the the interpretation of it is like how far can somebody go with in terms of who really makes the movie in terms of like you can write something but it's really what role does the actor and ha- the what role does the actor have in making the movie what it is in terms right. of deviating from the script for the fact of they feel like this would do it, or do they even have the right to say this is how it should be? Well, I guess the uh, best way to put it is who makes the movie, the director or the actor? It, it could be more than that. It but uh, just to put it very simply, yeah. So I guess, David, we'll start. Uh, no, Jeremy. we'll go with Jeremy. We'll start with Jeremy, yeah. Jeremy. Okay, uh, I watched a movie recently. Um, actually, give me a second. I don't remember the name of the movie. <laughs> okay. Um, it... <laughs> This shows how Sorry. many movies Jeremy has watched. This he is, doesn't remember the name of what he watched. This is a uh, great podcasting, Jeremy. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm trying to. I'm trying to get you guys up to number ten. Do you want me to sing while we wait? I can. <laughs> <laughs> sing your favorite little Doogie song. No, no, no. almost there. Guys. Everybody, look up Little Doogie. <laughs> he is a New Orleans right rapper. <laughs> okay, I watched a movie recently called Bad Roomies. Uh, this is a complete independent movie. I saw it on Netflix, uh, and it's got Patrick Renna. And for those of you who don't know, Patrick Renna played in The Sandlot. He was uh, the Hamilton, the great Hambino. Ham, Ham. the catcher. Yes. Uh, the he's only, still doing movies? He's, he does commercials, or, or, movies. Or he the is, Big Green. 
Oh, the Big Green also, yes. Oh, God. The only reason I watched this movie, the only reason I put this movie on my queue is because I was like, that's a little f***er from Sandlot. I'm, yeah, f- yeah, I'm going to watch this movie. So okay. I watched the movie. The movie, I mean, I get what? Maybe five stars, six stars. Not that great of a movie. Out of ten. Out of ten. Okay. Not out of five. I respect. You can't get six out of five. <laughs> um, I respect I the ten-point scale. <laughs> Not five. Not five. Um, so... The only reason I watched the movie was because of him. And I'm thinking, like, the director had to know that his main draw was this guy because people my age are going to be like, to say the same thing. That's the guy from Sandlot and possibly the Big Green. Um, so I feel like in his case, if you're making a movie with a whole bunch of unknowns, you pretty much can do whatever you want to do. So you would say that it probably favors more the actor than the director? Depending on the movie, depending on the cast. Because if you have a, let's say, Ocean's 13, or uh, Ocean's 11, rather, cast, I guess it doesn't matter. Um, I was going to say it's the same Yeah, film. it's the same thing. Um, of course, George Clooney is your lead, but you also have Brad Pitt and... Um, Matt Damon? Matt Damon uh, in the movie, who are huge stars uh, and A-list on everything. Uh, they're not going to be able to just be like, I'm going to do whatever the fuck I want to do because you got a whole, you got six or seven other A list actors as well on that same movie. Now, maybe um, Bernie Mac or uh, Scott Kahn wouldn't be able to do that, definitely, because they are more minor than those other ones. So what would you consider to be the ranking? I guess it's a case-by-case basis, and this is an unfair question, but what would you consider the ranking in terms of what makes the movie the most, the writer, director, or the actors? Because you have some people, like, I know Quentin Tarantino writes his own movies and directs them, so it's kind of like pigeonholing in the same space, but I'm trying to consider, like, a movie where all of them were kind of uh, taking, taken from nothing, and you had to decide, like, a pure movie where you had to decide which one made it the best. And I, I want to say... All right, how many movies did Danny Boyle have before 28 Days Later? Because Cillian Murphy was not exactly on the map before that. Uh, he probably had about, I mean, he had train spotting and a couple other things in between there, Sunshine, but I would probably say he had like five, six, maybe seven movies. And Alex, had... and Alex Garland wrote that, right? 28 Days Later, yes, yes, he did. Okay, so then I guess it's a decent example of like, who made that? Alex Garland, Danny Boyle. Or Cillian Murphy and the rest of the cast, like uh, Naomi Harris, I think that was it. Brendan Gleeson. I think that's a movie that is a collaborative effort. That's that, I don't think that's one particular person. Uh, and I think most movies, most good movies, I'm, I'm, uh, are, are the same way. I'm a huge fan of the Academy Awards. I know it's not a popular thing to say these days, but I, I, I do. I, every time the Academy Awards uh, nominees come out, I make it a point to watch all the best pictures, all the best actors, everything before the awards come on so I can have my own opinion rather than hope for something I've never seen that actually sucks. Like with Inherent Vice, I was hoping that that won, and then I saw the movie, and I was like, I I absolutely hate this movie uh, for best uh, adapted screenplay. Um, Lost my train of thought, sorry. Well, you're saying it takes a village, basically. It it, it does. For, For great movies, for most great movies, I will say the exception of Tarantino, of course, because writer and director, he he pretty much makes those movies and he is an actor, okay? Sometimes. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> but yeah. a good director does bring a good performance out of their talent. You I, see, I would you agree with watch, that. You can watch great actors do terrible work. Well, I mean, I think and a lot of times it's an uninspiring script and a director who's not telling them what they need to know. I feel like Robert Ken De Niro Bernal's in every Midsummer movie. Night's Dream is a very good example well, of I was, that. I was, see, I even have a better example. I was going to say Paul Thomas Anderson taking Adam Sandler and putting him in Punch Drunk Love. Oh, you just pulled out like the... Okay. Well, you, ta- you have Paul Thomas Anderson who takes Adam Sandler is like, all right, take everything that you know and completely turn it on his head. Same thing with adaptation with Nick Cage. And Bruce Willis and Sandler Kevin Smith. Rain on me. But yeah, David, I, I, oh, David, oh, yeah. David's oh, David got punch well, drunk love on no, the block but, right here. No, uh, I love that film. I, uh, so do I. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah, no. <laughs> I, I love that film. And, you know, I'd maybe like to go back to Germany, Jeremy. Um, but, however, I would say even to Punch Drunk Love, to me, the, the most important element of the that music? film is the music. Yep. <laughs> John Bryan. <laughs> it's, it is, it is the, to me, to me, it is the, the film. You know, I'm a huge fan of film scores myself. I think uh, your question is interesting, uh, is a very interesting quest, question, very multifaceted. Um, for me, I think the idea of considering authorship of actors essentially now with what we're dealing with with the movie studio system is that the actor is the person that gets a movie financed 
Yes. He's the promotion at that point. So you, so so just for sake of example, you're saying that like the reason Iron Man gets all this money thrown into it, the Iron Man franchise is because of Robert Downey Jr. What I'm trying to say is that if you wrote a screenplay yourself, and this is not a knock against you, but you talk your buddies with person. Matthew McConaughey, and Matthew McConaughey wants to star in the lead role, I bet you you could get this movie made. Okay, I think that is a very great point. It's the down make. payment on the film, pretty much. I, I, or in Iron Man, the downy payment. So, well, it, it's, it's well a, Iron Man is kind of different just, just because it's a superhero uh, film. <laughs> no, it's just his pun. Well, uh, so I got, I, I, I got a kind of devil's advocate here, okay? Speaking of movies here, train and plane. This is the, the audio killer. We no, we, about no, no, no. we've acknowledged them now, so we're okay. I was, I was nice. say the same thing. Well, we've acknowledged them, so now it's okay. So, so Devil's Advocate here, okay? <laughs> we live by a shipyard. Anthony Hopkins just had a new, new new movie come out, okay? Anthony Hopkins, such a huge face Sir in the Anthony movie Hopkins. industry. Huh? Sir Anthony Hopkins. Okay. Um, Anthony Hopkins <laughs> just had a new movie come out, <laughs> and it made $141 this weekend. <laughs> oh Jesus! One hundred and forty-one. I didn't. Not million dollars. It's 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 all about marketing, though. On some movies, look how bad Pan bombed. Pan, I mean, but Pan Pan bombed. But if you give Pan's numbers with some of these independent movies, they would take it for sure. No, I mean, it's, it's all about what's put into it. What's put into it? Put into exactly. It. But I'm just I'm using that as an example <laughs> to show like you can still have these big name actors and then nothing will come. But sometimes these big name actors like to do these little independent movies that That's aren't going to make any Anthony money. Fair, Anthony Hopkins hasn't been anything major in quite some time. Sir Anthony Hopkins. <laughs> Anthony Hopkins hasn't been anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, Sir Anthony Wait, Hopkins. Was he Sir when he made the movie? Which movie? I, I don't know. It just came out. But <laughs> then no, yes, keep keep going, David. Like I, I think that's a really great. But discussion. he hasn't been around in a while, right? Who's that? What, no, he, he does things all the time. No, he does. What's yeah. the, yeah. the latest movie he was a leading role in? I, maybe I'm just I'm not thinking of he it. He did uh, Beowulf. I know. He actually I'm, was Hitchcock. I'm dating myself. He was he, he was, was Hitchcock. Hitchcock. That's yeah. a great point. All right, there we go. Okay, cool. I just haven't like he was in a lot of movies in the 90s and mid 2000s. Like he's in a lot of major 2001, movies. 2001, Red That was 15 years ago. I forget. <laughs> I say Beowulf. That was like 2006, 2007. Angelina Jolie stole kidnapping the role Mr. Heineken. One. I don't even know what that is. It's actually I've never heard of that. We're, we're we're getting off the rails here again, David. No, I, I really want you to continue with. Oh, yeah, let's right, wrap it up with David, and then we'll go to the next question. Yeah, yeah. No, I I, I think the the point that I was trying to make, um, the point that I was trying to make was essentially that if you're in a kind of system in which the actor is the person that gets the film, maybe made. Um, not successfully, but financed, but wait, uh, but made the. I think that the actor in that scenario has a lot of creative weight. You know, he has a lot. Of, he can get a lot of input uh, input into the film because if he wants, if he wants to pull an attitude and he wants to walk, the whole film, everything behind it is really behind him. They kind and of assume a de facto producer I th- role. I think, I think that's a great point. And and just to kind of piggyback off that, I, I call that the uh, the American History X effect how Edward Norton was the star of that film and how he had final cut over that film over the director. And the reason the film ended the way it did was because that's what he chose for it to, for it to end. And and that was not what the director's vision was whatsoever. I didn't Tony K didn't make, what did he want? Tony K didn't make another movie for like 15 years yeah, because of that movie. He basically wanted um, the, uh, the Edward Norton character to be shaving his head in the mirror after his brother dies at the end. That's a spoiler. I shouldn't mention that before. Well, yeah, that, that, that doesn't really give anything away, though. Well, I mean, he, it's a it's a huge part of the film, though. It, it really for, it's it's for like twenty something yeah, years. Exactly. It, and, and if they would have done a, that, it would have canceled out everything they did in the movie. Exactly. It would have made the movie completely, completely null different. and void. Yeah. It, it would have been like, okay, why did I even watch this? Because uh, that's, well, that's stupid. Well, but in some movies, the point at the end is that nothing ever changed. Like, what is American Psycho, right? This confession has meant nothing. Well, Clockwork Orange is a very good example <laughs> of that because if you've read the book versus point. if you have seen the movie, the book ending and the movie. And okay, I'll go with the extra verse real quick. I'm sorry. Once again, this is a very old book and a very old movie with spoilers. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm a strong believer that oh. 20 plus years, spoilers are allowed. Yeah. All right. So Clockwork Orange pretty much the difference between the book and the movie is that this is actually uh, Stanley Kubrick is the most polarizing thing for me. 2001 is my favorite movie, but I hate Stanley Kubrick as a person and almost a director because of how much authority he takes over the original content. And I'm not going to get into that right now. I really don't want to sidetrack us that much. But the difference is that the book for Clockwork Orange, when it, the lost chapter pretty much turns it into a coming of age book, and Clockwork Orange, the movie is a regression into kind of this whole still being yourself even after 
going against what society tells you to do. And I think that that's a big difference between, you know, what actually makes the movie. And I guess what we were talking about in general was... Um, authorship? <laughs> what? Yeah, authorship, authorship pretty much. I mean, not to say Clark Orange wasn't a good movie because I still liked it. It's just b- having read the book first, it left a sour taste in my mouth. And I guess that really depends on, like, viewpoint. And I, I guess since we can't get a solid answer from anybody, this everybody has different answers, and I like all of them, it's pretty much the consensus is it takes a village. It's a case-by-case basis. There's no way to really tell who really determines the movie unless it's actually, you know, the movie you're talking about. It has to be the specific one. Yeah, not to pull the whole I work in film card, but just, like, you and David can do as much as you want especially, to. You especially get appreciated when you see, like, what makes a historical piece come to life, for instance? It, it's wardrobe. I mean, it's wardrobe, it's hair and makeup, it's set deck. Like, what makes an environment come to life if not the people who set the stage, right? Barry so Lyndon. that works in that, yes. Pluto yeah. Nash. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's like there's there's certain situations that come to life. What happens when we see Will Ferrell, a comedic actor, pull an amazing depth performance in um, Stranger Fiction? Fiction. I, I go, not only as Tal's an actor, but a director who led a comedic actor into a dramatic performance. I think the two of them work together. So it's a Right, so I think everything. everything different, there's a different emphasis, but I think it, it definitely takes a village. Well, I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Adam McKee did Anchorman, did all kind of these other projects, now just did uh, the movie last year, The Big, Big Short. Short. Okay? Did all these comedy movies, now does, does a, a, a dramatic movie. Sure. So you're talking about having actors... That are typically comedic, i.e. Adam Sandler, Will Ferrell, and then maybe more dramatic roles. But what about directors that do typically do more comedy that transition into more dramatic? Well, he definitely let some of his comedy out in that film. Yeah. I mean, and, and I'm not Steve saying, Eisman. I'm not like, saying yeah. I disagree with anything that you say. Yeah, yeah, no. I'm, saying, I'm just but playing I think devil's advocate. That just means he's a talented director. And I will say that. Okay. <laughs> I think that's. He's a very, I think a, I think he's a a very talented answer. director. Judging by what I said by Kubrick a second ago, I will still say he is probably the most diverse director I've ever seen. And and I would have killed to have seen his. <laughs> David. I'm sorry. David's well, cringing. Well, I would have killed to have seen no. Kubrick's Western. Let's put it this way, but okay? I will. We we need to we need to go to well, the next uh, question soon. Okay, I, I, I do want to say go one ahead. thing, Josh. You talk about um, directors pulling yeah, exactly. out uh, uh, of the, uh, uh, pulling things out of actors uh, with uh, Stranger Than Fiction. Does that mean that Tom Hanks, who started his career in comedies, did nothing but comedies up until the mid '90s? I want to say Philadelphia was his first one. Does that mean that Jonathan Demi is responsible? Wait, that was a comedy. No, that was his first I know, drama. I know, I know. I know. That's yeah. hilarious. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Not funny We at just all. talked about dark kidding. comedies. Um, <laughs> does that mean that Jonathan Demi is responsible for everything that, uh, for every dramatic movie that Tom Hanks has done since Philadelphia? No. No, I think I'm, it's, I'm not, no, no, I'm not saying that the, I'm not saying, I'm saying it's a dial. I'm saying it, it's two things. It's the director pulled a good performance out of him, but it also showed Will Ferrell's depth and skill as an actor. Yeah, but it's, it's diversity both full. to yeah. create that character okay i thought as i'm saying is that it's a dialogue between that's what my whole point is that neither one of them did individually it was these two together brought a great performance out of him combined with maggie gyllenhaal's character combined with all these things like that made that film what it was dustin hoffman and great writing (laughs) like the ending the ending big climactic part that was a really tense thing that was a powerful and this was like between the writing between the great direction between will ferrell's if will ferrell's a crap actor no amount of directing could have saved it right so I, I was just playing devil's advocate, but David, what do you want I to say? I have to man? pull a uh, devil's advocate on Ryan. This is this is a whatever point, but I think, in my personal opinion, the most underrated and actually probably the most diverse director is Rob Reiner. Um, okay, I can see, I, I can I can see a one. very fair argument for that. I mean, Didn't he spinal. Do North? Ta- he did uh, Stand by Me. This is Spinal Tap. But the he Princess did North. Bride. Okay, actually, I've never I- laughed more than the. 12 inch Stonehenge getting yes, lowered down during this is Spinal Tap, so I, I'll give you that one. I, I'll go with that. Yeah, and then and he made Princess Bride. So. And then he did Misery, and then he did Stand by Me. I just think that guy is. All you have changed my opinion. Okay, yeah. but oh. with that, I, we should go to the next. <laughs> oh, I, I was going to say, I think I think that's a very fair point. What is a movie, and I'll and I'll date it, you know, 2000 and on, that you know, the last 16 years that have come out that you think. 50 years from now, people are going to say that is the best movie of the last 50 years. Oh, geez. That's heavy. <laughs> I mean, I'm yeah, the question inher- inherently has a bias, right? There is some kind of bias, yeah. But, I mean, if you really believe that, you know, 
um, you know, Bucky Larson <laughs> is the movie that's going to change a generation 20 years from now, uh, then that's fine. All right, I'm going to have to go with one that I just think from time to time. Okay. I, 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 I mean, I probably, have my own answer as well. Yeah, I think that it's too di- um To me, that there, there's just a difference between what's going to be influential and be remembered as influential and what will be. I personally believe that blue is the warmest color is, is going to be treasured for okay. decades. I, to I, me, I, I know that that's, that's the weird answer, but to me, that's the first thing that popped that's in my a, mind. No, that's a great answer. I, I think that's a very good point. Now, that... What do you think? So you think that'll be the most remembered? No, or, I, or I think it'll be one of the ones that are remembered. Okay, what do you think will be most influential then? Oh, I mean, it's too too soon to tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's kind of like predicting the future at that well, point. Well, I mean, I I think that it, it's not that. It's just like a movie that you saw that you're like, there's going to be that so much taken from that because it changed. And I'm not even necessarily saying like Avatar with CGI. I'm saying... You know, I, I guess I'll answer it. For me, the movie that will be the most influential, personally, will probably be There Will Be Blood. Oh, damn it. I, I think there is so much that that movie accomplishes and the way that it does it between the cinematography, the score, uh, the acting, the directing, I think everything that it encompasses, uh, and, and to a certain extent, the master as well. Two Paul Thomas Anderson movies, I think, will be very influential in the way that people decide to go about things i guess just to step back really quick i think in terms of influential to me i think that you can already see the ripple effect of it is probably going to be the matrix okay i was that was thinking in terms matrix, of that's a great answer yeah. it's, it's, it's I, been ripped yeah. off so much but if you want the right answer it's toy story okay okay yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> if you like but if you want the right answer here's, <laughs> here's the thing though that was 1995 yeah and uh i, oh, I, I, said I, I, I dipped time. okay <laughs> toy story Two or no? The, well, Toy Story three then. I. <laughs> I mean, it's Toy Story was every what, okay before I, okay. So I'm going five years in the grand scheme of things. Five years isn't that much. Um, but uh, Toy Story. Said ten, I think it was a ten, huh? No, I, I said two thousand and on. Okay. Okay. So let's I, think give, about give this. Give me five though. years. Here's the thing, though. The Great Depression happened in 1932. Five years later, we were on the brink of World War Two. Okay. A lot can happen in five years. A lot can happen in five years. But the reason that we got into a, uh, the way we got out of the Great Depression was because of the war. And Toy Story. Oh, I have and a Toy fundamental Story. disagreement. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I, I actually disagree with that wholeheartedly, but I w- I'd like to hear your, your answer. To the Toy Story or to the I think Great we'll give Depression? the Toy Story a pass because I think Toy Story gets a pass for those years because that I one is... <sighs> that wasn't the stipulation. All right, okay. Uh, well, then I'm going to go with my answer of uh, my favorite movie, Requiem for a Dream, to see how much the drug culture uh, has affected, because I'm, I'm sure the drug culture is going to get way worse in 50 years, to see kind of the beginning of it and how it influenced people uh, back in 2000 versus how it's going to influence people in uh, 20, what's 50 years from now? 2066? 20, or just 20, you can even say 2050. 2050. Yeah. I, I, I think that's, that's a very valid point. That's your favorite movie. Yes. I, I think that's a really good, really good insight into that because I, that kind Not of brought no, the broadband angle I really wasn't thinking of, but I think that I, I can't knock that. I think that's a really good way to, to that, that vocalizes you know the culture that was at that time. Because you can even say now that the drug culture is so different than what it was when the movie was made. Yeah. Can I get a pass for mine? No. It's literally a one year difference. I think this came in 1999. Well, so sort of the Matrix. So if we're talking the Matrix, Matrix Commander. Is it is it Titanic? It's not Titanic. That was 97. Oh, this off. one is kind of the way it shaped this genre of movie in general. Uh, I, I would I would go back further. The first one I would say, what I really want to get to is Thin Red Line. For mm. odd reason, because I think that was 1999. I don't have anybody. I was gonna say it was 98. 98. <laughs> Come on. Same year, Give same the, Ryan. I'm curious, <laughs> the only reason I say this is because I'm curious what your I'm just curious what your logic is. Yeah, I am too. Because of the format of a, over the format of a war movie. There's two others that I could really think of in general. Um, Apocalypse Now was a good precursor, and then Kubrick's movie. Uh, which one was it? Full Metal Fair Jacket. Or Fair, Full Metal Jacket. No, not Fairyland. Okay, no, never mind. It was the one. Apocalypse with, Now. No, not Apocalypse Platoon, Now. Platoon. The we World were War One French Regiment. Oh. Whoa, whoa, um. Wait, just a Paths of Glory. Paths of, Pass of Glory. Glory. Great movie. It's I fantastic. feel like really uh, Thin Red Line brought such an all-star cast in there, and when people watched it, it's because they had so. We, we were going back to the actors really sold that, even though they, like Malik has this terrible tendency to only put a big actor in there for two minutes, and kind of almost do a bait and switch on the on the viewer. But really, that was the one that made War look gruesome and brought it back into people's heads. So I think there was a big gap between Apocalypse Now and 
thin red line that really made war look like a bad thing. And now if you see something like Jarhead or even Three Kings or you can go into The Kingdom, none of those have made it look like, and I think American Sniper would even be a good example of this. That's uh, a little yeah. bit more debatable. It's one of those where it has changed the genre to the point where nobody has made it seem like a glorious thing to go to war. Oh, Hurt Locker a little bit. Oh, PTSD. All, almost all of them. It's a, it became an issue of PTSD and not wanting to do this and having like the actual personal aspect to a war film as opposed to just showing what happened during this war. And I think that's influential in the fact that it really changed the tone where it brought back the personal aspect to the people that are fighting the war as opposed to yeah. actually showing what was going on in the war. And I, I think I'm a little bit more influenced by, I guess, you know, Dan Carlin penalty shot. I know he brings a very good personal aspect into it and in showing like what the actual damage was. And I think that these, narrative like that, yeah. these movies do that to the point where it's like, you know, you could even go from say even world war two, there's probably a few Germans that were on the lines that you could sympathize with because they don't exactly back up the cause, but they are that's, trying to be patriotic in a certain sense. That's a dangerous. That, that's a dangerous conversation, and not dangerous in the sense that, like, I don't want to go there. Dangerous in that we could do so much content solely based on that. But the 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 short answer is yes, you are correct. I I would feel that that at least in terms of a genre, because it's hard to say what's most influential on a whole range of movies, because I think anything like um, Eternal Sunshine would be one for turning you know, the artsy romantic comedies. And I would even, like, that's even another uh, idea of, like, is that a dark comedy? Is that a romantic comedy? Is that a little bit of a mix of everything? But those type of movies kind of have this gray area that have, you've seen a couple more of them. Wes Anderson's great at doing that. He's great at actually making you feel He's like one shit. one of the best directors. And the making, <laughs> having comic relief. Like, it's all about timing. But I'm going to pick a certain thing, and I'm going to say with war movies, you have not seen a war movie recently that has been, like, hailed in the box office has been like, yeah, this is fucking patriotic. Most of the time it's like, well, yeah, we went and we won, but what, what was the cost? Lose? It's yeah. the Pyrrhic victory type of deal. Well, I, I appreciate your one-word answer, Ryan. Um, well, you know. <laughs> I, like think, one word. I think uh, <laughs> I think an, you, you made me think of another one, uh, par Paranormal Activity. Yeah. How influential is that, is, has that been to the horror genre? But you can put Cloverfield in there, too, because both Blair of those Witch. Oh, well, but see, Blair, you can, yeah, argue, yeah, you you can you, argue Blair Witch. Blair Witch, Witch was, the first. was the first. I would but, put Blair Witch first. But, I will say, but, but Paranormal Activity, I mean, how much secret camera, hidden camera, you know, infrared camera, bullshit, night vision camera, have you seen since Paranormal Activity? And regardless of the rest of them, like the rest Thank of the Paranormal you, Activities, the first one, that was the well, first and last movie that I've seen recently that has genuinely scared me in theaters to the point where I was like cowering, like I don't want to see the was next Rec thing Was before happens. Paranormal Activity? No, it wasn't. No, no, no. Uh, so I want to know your answer, Greg. So this is where I'm kind of a little torn um, because – one movie I think that was fantastic, and it was one of those ones that like it kind of what happened with Donnie Darko, right? Where or where it's like people went, oh, this is amazing, then it became popular. Went, oh, Primer? It's no, no, no. Primer, I, I'll stand. I don't think it's influential. I just think it's a great film. But um, I think it's influential for different reasons. Yeah, but not in, like in a, in, right. on a national yeah. level. That's not in the common mind. Um, I think the I think Fight Club. Um, because okay. it's Ooh, one of the only 99? movies. Well, it's it might 97, be. I believe. Oh, it's, it's 99. It's 99. 99. Oh, pardon me. Well, my my disqualified. Quick, quick little reasoning behind it is that um, yeah, after <laughs> after Thin Red Line, <laughs> I'm I'm my quick rep reason is because thin, that was one of the first movies I saw, and it's not the first one that did, but like in the same way that um, a film like um, um, uh. Oh my God, Kevin Spacey, Suburban Dream, American Beauty, American Beauty, um, American Beauty captured that idea of like white picket fence means nothing does not that, hold up right no it doesn't but um i think there's the idea that this. the suburban dream falls apart that i think what i like about fight club is that it really 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 addresses it's not like people think that's cool like oh it's fighting and the people go it's about materialism man but then when you get down to the real level of it the one line that really makes the entire movie relevant is when he has a short little monologue where he says he is in uh, Tyler Durden okay. says he goes, we have no great war. We have no great depression. Our great war is a spiritual one. Our great depression is our lives. And he's basically saying we are aimless and we are lost. And the void we fill it with is materialism. But the real thing he's saying is that like, this is our lives. And like, we, we spend every day trying to scrape by and make a living. And, he, was that the first movie to do it? No, but it was a great movie to really nail that concept. Just our great wars, a spiritual one, our, our great depressions, our lives. It's like that very, really yeah. just the angst of like, 
people always say the greatest generation, right? And it's like, but in some ways, how wonderful would it must have been to have a clear call and a goal in your life? I mean, think about that. Not that war is pretty. And a lot of them, the ignorance of what war was is what dragged them out there. But really to know that if you make this decision, your life is validated. That's, that's, that's a really powerful motivation. And I think that film encapsulates like, we don't know what the f*** to do. Like, and so I think that's what kind of like, I part of the reason I defend the hell out of Pacific Rim and Interstellar. Not that Interstellar is particularly controversial, but Pacific Rim people think has no depth. And I go, those are the first two movies that, for me, speaks to me. Because those movies deal with resource crunch. It deals with, as a young person, what happens when there's no opportunity. It deals with what happens when the frustration of a generation above you making decisions and you're trying to fight back at it. Not just from a hippie standpoint, but like, what is Pacific Rim? We want to build, we want to fight it and take the fight to the enemy while the elderly generation will build a wall and keep them out, right? They want to stave off the inevitable. Ten that's feet what higher. they're trying to do. 10 feet higher. But that's the thing. They, they, that's, that's, 10 that's, subscribers that's, less. Right? And Pacific, that, that is what Pacific Rim to me means. It's about, it's that. And, and Interstellar is like, what is Matthew McConaughey's character? He's almost not human. He's just a human spirit. Like he's literally a spirit in the film, he's, but he's, he's almost the human spirit. He's, he's almost robotic at points he because he's, he, he's, he's fighting for humankind, whether they agree with it or right. not. And he's untethered. Like he is so quick to abandon his family. He goes, it's because I want to protect my family, which is an authentic thing. But you know that half that motivation is like humanity. What do we do at night? We look up to the stars. His character is that idea. Okay, with Pacific Rim, though, I think the problem with that movie is that it may have been to you this deeper meaning, but it was marketed and it was released as a summer blockbuster. And rock yes. and yes. Completely the yes. wrong medium. That's to yes. me, when Charlie Day is the best actor in that entire yeah. movie, that's what is my problem well, with the, the movie. I just thought it was pretty <laughs> great. Yeah. Idris Elba bombed yeah, that. Was terrible. So, Rinko Kikuchi. She did Babylon. That was... I, I like the movie. Uh, some people don't, but like Babel. I was sorry, Babel. Babel. Yeah, Babel yeah, yeah. Sorry, I didn't like Babel. That's that a great movie, movie. That movie. It's just like uh, th- everything went wrong in that. It's Guillermo del Toro for fuck's sake. Well, like, uh, uh, and well, everything went wrong in that movie. Nah, well, I, 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 I kind of want to just say there is a difference between what the movie was marketed as and what the movie was. Because if like you want to brave, t- well, I was going to say <laughs> you take killing them softly, okay. Oh, oh, great example. It's a, great such example. a great movie. But what it was marketed as was this... Lock, stock, shoot and up. Smoking Exactly. Or, or The Assassination <laughs> by Jesse James by the Coward Robert Ford. Another, probably one of my top five favorite movies of all time, okay? You think it's going to be like a Jesse James train robbery kind of movie, cowboy, you know, western sling him and gun him kind of thing. But it was not that at all. It was such a character-driven film. And so I don't think it's fair to say this movie was not marketed right, so therefore it is not a good film. I think there needs to be. I'm not saying that at all. No, I know, I know, but I'm I'm just saying like there needs to be a distinct distinct distinction between. I'll get there eventually. That's an inherent problem in the film industry, but, though. But and but I was gonna say that's not something I'm gonna go into. So besides Fight Club, Greg, what was the other film that you would say might be most? No, that was, I was saying I was saying Fight Club is a big one for me, and I say just for modern like I don't know if they're Fight Club. I think is one that can hold up over time. Um, Interstellar, I think, I love it and I stand by it. I think it there's some je ne sais quoi it's missing. I don't know what it is, but there's something it's missing that I think is going to hurt it in the long run. I still stand by and think it's a beautiful film. I think like for instance that drone scene in the beginning is actually magical, like driving through the cornfields chasing the drone. Yeah, no, but it, it um, but um, and and Pacific Rim, I think it's just, just for for me like I think a lot of films speak to generations, like uh, Bonnie Jim, and Clyde for for, I, it's, for, it's for 60s, one, right? Real quick before we get to your last counterculture, question, well, and I was going to see if Jeremy and David went. Well, I just want to say if add. if if Greg can say a movie from 1989. No, uh, I was no it doesn't count. I don't count it. The only thing I'll go into Interstellar then Toy Story is, that, is, is the correct answer. I don't, I don't I, count I, it. You know, I, I almost agree with Toy Story at this point. But, but I, think it's a, <laughs> I think it's a very good answer. But, Greg, I think the thing for Interstellar, and this is just, we're not going to get any more into it. I think the thing is there's no fish out of water in the movie to really guide the character, to like guide the audience. It's everybody knows what that world is, and it's kind of that's uh, a fair point. No it's a one's lot of learning. assumptions taken. No one's learning. The movie. No one's like growing. The movie as a doesn't take its and... time to explain to you what is going on. It just happens. And whether you a lot ex- of movies do that though, but, but it does a good but job. It's at to painting such the a scene. different extent, extent though. Okay, there's one thing like Primer. Okay, 
it's one thing, and I know that you're such a huge fan of the film, and as am I, <laughs> and I love that film. It's one thing for the, the plot to develop and things unfold, and you just kind of be there for the ride, and you're just like, well, what just happened? In Interstellar, there's so much that goes on, but if you don't understand what they're talking about, it's not going to make any sense. It's a lot of assumptions taken. And they don't hold your hand through it. I think there's a very big distinction between the two. It's the Dark Primer Souls of not movies. not hold your hand. No, 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 no. But what I'm saying is that you... You may not understand Primer fully, but as you sit there and think about it, you're like, okay, well, I can kind of put these pieces together. Enough together to figure out the story. Exactly. Was. As far as Interstellar goes. And like the and collapse I, of a friendship, And ultimately. I loved Interstellar, okay? And, I, and I taking, yeah. I, I've and taken i taken physics classes, and I understand a lot of the, the theories they're talking about. Maybe not to the, well, obviously not to the fullest extent, but I understand a lot of the math-based operations that, the, that they're doing and why they're going from A to B, but... I understood that as far as for me personally, I understood it, but I know that maybe my brother, who's not a math major, he, he'd watch that film and be like, what just happened the last hour? I don't know what any of this is. Uncle Rusty. Uncle Rusty most certainly wouldn't understand anything. You have an uncle named on. Rusty? Yeah. <laughs> so welcome to the podcast, David. <laughs> <laughs> so is there anything else that Jeremy or David, that either one of you want to add to, to that long-winded rant I told you I wasn't influential one films. Word. Yeah, just when I go off of Greg's point and, and, and maybe not speaking towards the influence of Fight Club, you know, I'm not, I'm not completely sh- sure. But Yeah, the only what, time will tell. No, certainly, but I think that 2020. whether or not you can say that it's uh, influential or not, I, I think definitely, you know, if, if uh, film will be considered a literature that will illuminate kind of to people that study history in 100 years about this time period, I think that Fight Club will be a great landmark film that will kind of talk about uh the you know culturally and socially what's really going on in the world or at least at that time i think it could possibly make national film registry yeah it probably will and uh, real quick before we get to greg's last question david if you were to get somebody named rusty what would you imagine that their job would be just off the top of your head Please. I, I just automatically, R- Rusty's Plumbing comes to mind. Uncle Rusty owns a, a plumbing company. Uncle Rusty's Mechanic. <laughs> Car Mechanic. <laughs> Close enough, yeah. It, it say automatic. Nobody has said engineer or mathematician <laughs> or <laughs> philosopher yet, so. All right, so Greg, you want to pose one last question before we wrap this deal up? Is this the uh, Wizard of Oz thing? Whatever you want I to was be, we were Do whatever you want, man. Well, I, okay, well, let's, we've gone a long time. Would you all want to... Don't have to say your. You want to do kind of like what's your favorite movie? Doesn't be your favorite movie, but what's let's make it a here. speed round. Let's see if we can do this. So I was, what I'm thinking is pick one of your top five, possibly your favorite film, and give like three sentences as to why. Oh, we have to justify this. Yes, three okay. sentences as to why. And if and and if you're going on too long and someone says it's too much, we got to move on. That applies to me too because I am very long winded. Okay. Well, Greg, you start. Don't us start off with then. me. Can we? Yeah. Start. No. Start with Greg. Okay. We'll go reverse order. Yeah. That's fine. Um. I can say confidently, if not number one, very close to number one is Warrior for me. I still stand by that. <laughs> it's beautiful cinematography. It was a movie that was incredibly poorly marketed, and I went in with low expectations, and it blew me out of the water. Um, and only movie I've ever seen that pulled off two points where they could have rolled credits. And that's when he beats Kolba, and uh, obviously the final scene. With it's his okay, Tommy. Yep, but the, when he beats Kolba, <laughs> the adrenaline rush I get, and the movie's not even over yet. And it just ramps you right back up again for the final ending. That movie is phenomenal. I, okay. I think that's very fair. For me, there's there's a, a lot I can go with. And I'm actually going to go with one that I don't think anybody's expecting. I'm going to go with Singing in the Rain. I okay. think that is such an influential movie. And the fact that they were able to pull off the the coordination that they did and all of the, the dancing and the singing and everything... I think it is such a huge part of American culture from that time frame. But I think that you can honestly see a lot from today where a lot of these movies stem from in Singing in the Rain. I think I think that, you know, the acting around is fantastic, even though the Gene Kelly is a piece of shit of a human being. <laughs> I, I'm not. I, but as the what actor, did he do to you? Huh? What well, did he didn't he do, do anything to, anything to me. <laughs> he made him dance backwards but in heels. He, but the choreography, <laughs> well, the choreography and, and the cinematography and the dancing and everything was coordinated so well. And. I just I really respect the movie for what it is, and it's easy to go with The Departed or 2001 or anything like that. But to me, that it's just such a, a, a specific film that I think that not a lot of people give it the chance, and not a lot of people give it its credit. So that's my answer, Ryan. 
All right, so I'll try to make this one quick because we're supposed to. Uh, I was going to give 28 Days Later, but I'll do 2001 because I have better justifications for that. It works on three different levels. It's a very cinematic movie. You can watch it and not hear a single line of dialogue and still be kind of awestruck by it. The practical effects for it were unparalleled in general. <laughs> Jeremy's rolling his eyes. <laughs> I, I know, I, and I'm poking him with a stick right now. The practical effects were unparalleled for what it was. It actually it was a Citizen Kane of sci-fi, and the fact that they... The soundtrack wasn't even supposed to be what it is now. They just left the kind of filler tracks at that point, and it worked perfectly. It was a happy accident. And you heard what I said about Kubrick. And thirdly, I would say it's very good because I I don't agree with what, um, what's his name, Ridley Scott said, that sci-fi is dead because 2001 already happened because there have been a lot of great sci-fi movies that happened afterwards. But 2001 put sci-fi on the map as a serious genre to be, you know, considered for. Because you have yeah. all sorts of different, like, spacey movies. You have, like, you know, the Flash Gordon and everything. But you have the first one where sci-fi became science future. And I think it had a big cultural impact on the entire world for the most part. And really, I, I would be hard-pressed to think that there are not a whole lot of movies or even uh, TV shows that have been referenced. The Simpsons, every uh, tons of movies have been referenced to the 2001. You see it, Zoolander. In, you see it in fucking <laughs> everything, and that's why I really think that, that is one of the best movies, in my opinion, is because of the precedent that it set on so many different levels. Jeremy, your favorite Tyler Perry movie? Uh, my favorite <laughs> Tyler Perry movie? Uh, no. Um, Tyler Perry and Ernest should I'm, do I'm a, I, you know. I agree. If Ernest was still alive, they would probably have already made like three movies together. I, I they both go to jail. I'm going to take a guess. You're going to go Boogie Nights? I actually, yeah, I, I was. I, I know I said that um, Requiem for a Dream is my favorite movie, and it's up there. It's it's But Boogie Nights and Requiem for a Dream go hand in hand for me. But I'm going to say Boogie Nights because of the Drugs tone and of, porn. <laughs> not not because of the porn. But it's the it's the tone of the movie. He he doesn't go strictly drama. He goes drama he, and then he is in Paul Thomas. As Anderson. in Paul Thomas okay. Anderson, the director goes drama and then for shits and giggles, he goes comedy with things in the movie like uh, when they're making that soundtrack or when they're making that album. It, it's it it's like where are you coming from with this and why is this even in the movie? That's something that most people. Uh, most people making a movie, it would have ended up on the cutting room floor. Um, I, it's just the the tone of that movie, the acting of the movie, uh, it, the cast. The cast is f- to steal everybody else's words. It's phenomenal. It's such a good cast. It's such a good movie. It's such a fun movie. And yeah, Mark Wahlberg. Uh, okay. <laughs> Ultimately, David? yeah, Mark Wahlberg. Okay, David. Yeah, uh, mine. Uh, there's a few. There's a top five, but the one that always there's two that stay up there. But I, I guess if I'm gonna pick one, it'd probably be uh, Blue by uh, Christoph Kieslowski, the French part of the the, tr- the color trilogy. The color trilogy. Re- is it red, white, and blue? I think it was it was the order of the French flag, so I believe it was blue. The Cornetto trilogy. Oh, geez. Blue, white, red. Yeah. Okay, that's it. Blue, white, red. Yeah. yeah. But to me, it's just, um, you know, in terms of w- w- as a film goer, I, I guess the big thing for me is I'm a big fan of directors. I kind of look at the director as the helm of the project um, and the auteur. Uh, to me, Kislowski's Blue, you know, as a director, I think that he was one of the great, you know, humanist philosophers of film. And I think that um, he has this way of kind of taking ideas or taking um, abstract notions and to be able to dramatize them and i just felt that um t- in my opinion blue is is a perfect film you know it's a beautiful film awesome I, I i actually haven't seen the colors trilogy but i have it at my house i just need to watch it but i i, I think i just want to say you know personally from all of us jeremy and david thank you this was a lot of fun this is very different from what we, we typically do and you know this is something that we, we very much wanted to do and, and you two were instantly the first two people that we wanted to get on here and, and to do this with so just thank you so much for for taking the time to be here tonight and, and to talk with us and just have some fun thanks and, for having us thank you my pleasure yeah so um just thank you for all that and uh you know guys like we said we got some other things that we're working on that will be coming down the pipeline uh brian is there anything else you want to add to that Plug uh, I think you said just about everything. We don't we don't have a plug today. We're just not going to do it. Yeah, no plugs. We we love darkmyths.org. There's a plug. But uh, I guess since you took everything, if you want to reach us, talk to us about if you want to hear some more things kind of like this, we have plenty more topics that we can't exactly make a full official Rumor Flies episode of, but we can at least do a room t- roundtable with some, uh, just with a few friends or whatever guests we can fish up. 
let us know, and uh, you can contact us at what? Let's see, rumorflies yes, at rumorflies gmail. at gmail dot com. You can find us at rumorfliespodcast dot com at rumorflies on Twitter and Instagram. You can find us at rumorflies on Google Plus. Oh God damn um, it! You oh, do don't Google Plus? YouTube. Who the fuck? We is also Google? have a oh, YouTube <laughs> SEO dog, um, but uh, we do have a YouTube channel. It's kind of our like. It's it's meant for people who don't use podcast apps, things like that. It has audio. We also have. Um, we still need 100 subscribers for YouTube to get our own. To get our own to change <laughs> things. That's so. what we're pushing for. We don't care about Patreon or advertising. Anything. We just want our own YouTube name. There you go. And the um the YouTube we actually have two videos on there that are you know we have like the all the episodes up there. But by this we've time actually you might been, actually have a third video. Where up there. we're we're yeah we're working on getting the third one up as soon as possible. Um and yeah it might be up by the time this goes up. But yeah, it's it's a good little backup for those of you who don't use any podcast apps, and it's also just serves kind of like an emergency archive for us in case any of the sites go down. <laughs> yeah. So just thank you again for checking us out. I know this is not what you typically get from us, but we hope you really enjoyed it because we had a lot of fun doing it. So just to wrap all this up, thanks again for checking out, checking this out. Sorry. As always, I'm Josh. I'm Ryan, and I'm me. And we'll see you later, guys. Thanks again. Bye. Bye. I lied. We do have a plug. Go listen to Rob Clark's The Lone Gunman podcast. He's another one of our Dark Myths members. We've mentioned him before, but it's worth mentioning again. Go check him out. He covers almost every possible theory on the JFK assassination, and it is simply fascinating. It's all his opinions, and it's just somebody who did a lot of research into everything involving the case. And also, there's some New Orleans ties here, so we kind of hold that a little bit close to our hearts. So go check out The Lone Gunman, and have a good night.